Good evening and welcome to the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council program tonight with guest speaker Dr. Cullen Hendricks. Thanks to Dr. Hendricks and everybody who's joined us in person tonight and those who tried to join us online. I'm Catherine Whitnabin, Executive Director of the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council. We would like to thank the University of Iowa Political Science Department for their support for this presentation tonight. I especially like to thank Dr. William Reisinger, Dr. Brian Lai, and the great staff at the Political Science Department for their help. Um, we'd also like to acknowledge and thank our annual donors, members, sponsors, and partners for, for their support. This list includes the Iowa Arts Council through the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs, Humanities Iowa and the National Endowment for the Humanities, the University of Iowa's International Programs, Honors Program, and Public Policy Center, the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization, Midwest One Bank, and, and City Channel 4, and Ty Coleman especially for providing online access to our programs along with the UI Library Archives. So ICFRC has adopted the Native American Land Acknowledgement prepared by the City of Iowa's Ad Hoc Truth and Reconciliation Commission and Human Rights Commission. We recognize that our home community of Iowa City now occupies the homelands of Native American nations to whom we owe our commitment and dedication. The full text of our acknowledgement is on our website at icfrc.org. I would now like to introduce to you Dr. Elizabeth Meninga, Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Iowa, who is going to introduce our speaker and who will serve as moderator for this program. Thank you so much. Um, so Dr. Colin Hendricks is Senior Fellow at the Pearson Institute for International Economics, non-resident Senior Research Fellow at the Center for Climate and Security, and a specially appointed Research Professor with the Network for Education and Research on Peace and Sustainability at Hiroshima University. He is currently on leave from the Corball School of International Studies at the University of Denver. He is author of over 30 peer-reviewed articles on the relationships between international markets, national resources, as co and conflict, as well as the economic and security implications of climate change, and is co-author of the 2014 book, Confronting the Curse, the Economics and Geopolitics of Natural Resource Governance. Dr. Hendricks has authored reports published by or consulted for organizations including the Asian Development Bank, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, the National Intelligence Council, Oxfam America, USAID, and the World Food Program, among others. He was a contributing author to the 2022... I looked up the acronym, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report, uh, for which he assessed the implications of climate change for threats to peace and human mobility. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hendricks. Thank you so much. It's, it's wonderful to see so many faces out this late in the evening. Uh, I know you have a big game coming up against Michigan. You probably have a lot of entertainment options uh, in front of you right now. So thank you for taking a little bit of time out of your evening to spend it uh, with me. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. I haven't been in Iowa City for about, I think, 16 years. So it's lovely uh, to be back. Um, so my talk is called Putin, Petroaggression, and the Future of Energy Geopolitics. Uh, the future of energy geopolitics uh, is a subject that has occupied a great deal of my thinking now for, I guess I would say, the last five to six years as I have turned in my career from primarily being interested in, I guess I would say, the subject of tonight's talk, which is the implications of international commodity markets, specifically international commodity markets for global peace and security. Um, as I have pivoted from a primary focus on hydrocarbons, so the, the fuels that underpin our current and legacy energy systems, to thinking about the critical minerals that will be underpinning our transitions to more sustainable uh, energy systems moving forward. And indeed, that's where my talk is actually going to end up. Um, thinking about the implications of the end of the great oil century uh, and what that means for countries like Russia, which are deeply um, dependent on fossil fuels for government revenue and for their economic profile and engagement with the rest of the world. And that has pernicious effects for their geopolitical outlook, which I'll go into in great detail tonight. Um, but also... It, be, be thinking about the ways in which the pivot in the importance of particular inputs for energy systems is going to create a, a very different landscape, geopolitically speaking, moving forward. So um, 
we are now in the midst of the fifth global oil price crisis. Actually, we're kind of at the tail end of it, potentially, of the last 50 years and the fourth of my lifetime. Um, the first occurring in 1973, uh, the second occurring in 1979, the third occurring in 2008, the fourth occurring roughly from 2010 into 2013 and indeed 2014, and then finally the oil price crisis that we're dealing with now, which is the direct result of the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the subsequent sort of chaos that that has created in global energy markets, not just for oil, but also for liquefied natural gas, um, which, is, which is actually probably the component of the energy system and the component of Russia's exports uh, that has most significantly kind of conditioned the, the uh, interactions between Russia uh, and I would say the rest of Europe and indirectly the United States uh, in, the, in, in the subsequent um, course of the war to date. Now, I'm putting this chart up here, which shows these kind of price spikes and price levels over time over the last 50 years, because it's an interesting window into, I think, the geopolitics of the Soviet Union and later Russia. Indeed, you can tell a fairly interesting and, you know, not completely um, divorced from kind of reality sort of story about Russia's engagement in its near abroad um, by looking at the price of oil. So if we start in the, uh, in the 1970s, I'm two years old at this point, uh, oil is trading at then historic high prices uh, due to, in part to the fallout of the Iranian revolution and the, the disruption of its oil exports into global markets. It's at this time that the Soviet Union invades Afghanistan, famously known as the Graveyard of Empires, um, in order to prop up sort of a weak Soviet reg regime, or sorry, a, a weak Soviet-aligned communist regime there, and ultimately get bogged down in the same kind of intractable sort of counterinsurgency campaign uh, that the United States and its allies found themselves in uh, several decades later. Um, if we fast forward a little bit after oil prices declined in the 1980s and 1990s, which is something I'll come back to in a moment, um, we can then look at the period of 2007 and 2008 when oil prices again uh, reached kind of a local maximum of almost $120 per barrel. These are in 2020 constant dollars. And it was at that point that Russia invaded uh, the former Soviet Republic of Georgia, um, effectively for a time cutting the country in half, um, ostensibly in support of separatist uh, pro-Russian movements uh, in uh, the country of Georgia, which is something that probably sounds pretty familiar because it was ostensibly the same kind of rationale that um, led to Russia's annexation of the Crimea and later involvement uh, indirectly um, in the Ukrainian civil war, which began by and large in 2013 and 2014. Again, a period of, of high oil prices. And then I don't, probably don't need to say much to this audience especially about the effect that that has, has had on the current conflict. Um, and, and so I think all of these examples that I'm showing you in kind of rapid fire succession are emblematic of kind of a, a relatively representative um, story and trajectory for Russia's engagement in its near abroad over the last 50 years and how it is intimately related to oil prices and indirectly the resources that are available to the Russian government, previously the Soviet government, uh, to prosecute its foreign policy agenda. Um, but I also wanted to come back to this period you see here in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, many of you here in Iowa will remember this as a period of historic low prices in a variety of commodity markets, including food markets, which, in, which created incredible hardship uh, in the heartland, which is where I'm from as well. Um, this didn't just have localized effects here in the United States. This indeed had pretty significant effects for political liberalization uh, in the Soviet Union. That it was after essentially a decade of an oil glut and an increasing sort of mounting problems with the Soviet planned economy and its inability to service its increasing dependence on global markets via large oil revenues, oil export revenues, um, that ultimately you had a decline in the ability of the Soviet Union government to sort of enforce the compliance and enforce the subservience of its socialist republics. You have the breakup and subsequent sort of democratization of Russia during this time period. And I bring that up because that may be useful for helping us think about what the future might hold in a future when oil no longer is sort of the central axis around which global energy geopolitics revolves. 
So in my talk, I'm going to try and answer or sketch answers of three questions. So first is, what is this concept of petroaggression? Second, how is it affecting the war in Ukraine? So how can we look at a, a, a subject that's now the, the, the um, or a, a topic that's now the subject of relatively extensive literature and international relations, and how can we apply that to understanding the current moment that we find ourselves in, um, which is indeed the largest land war uh, in Europe in 70 years? And then finally, closing with this question of what is the future of energy geopolitics? Uh, and I'll, I'll comment a little bit about what Russia's future in that uh, Russia's role in that future might be, um, but I'll be thinking a little bit more broad aperture at that point. So hopefully this is in line with expectations of what you thought you'd be hearing about when you came in the door this evening. All right, let's start with this concept of petroaggression. Petroaggression is simply the tendency for petrostates, which are defined kind of amorphously as states whose economies and public finance, that is their revenues, revolve around oil and gas exports to be more war prone and for this tendency to be strengthened or weakened as the case may be by high or low price environments. Now this is a tendency uh, and, a, and, a, and a subject of, of inquiry that, that has kind of been pioneered by a friend of mine, Jeff Colgan, who's a professor at Brown University. It's also a literature into which I've kind of waded in my day job as a political scientist, thinking about the impacts of global commodity markets on conflict behavior. And one of my kind of small contributions to this literature was to note that there are pretty significant kind of price effects going on here. So that when you have high oil prices obtaining in international markets, petrostates, so states that, 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 are, that are deeply dependent on oil or other types of hydrocarbons for export revenues and for public finance, when prices are high, they're much more likely to initiate attacks um, and other types of aggression against other countries in the international system. And when prices are low, they're much less likely to. So it helps us to explain, in part, the timing of some of these military adventures or misadventures, as the case may be, that I, that I outlined a little bit earlier. So when you have a period like uh, during the oil glut and the, the, sort of the, the most recent low price environment, about $20 a barrel, um, on average, a, a petrostate would be about 30% 30, 30 less likely, holding everything else constant, to engage uh, militarily uh, in an offensive way with other countries in the international system. And then when you get to a point like 2008, where you have prices that are hovering at about, let's see, maybe almost $120 per barrel, they would be 50% more likely. Now, that doesn't mean that there's sort of a monocausal, single magic bullet, silver bullet explanation for all of Russia's foreign policy. But it does suggest that there is a general tendency of petrostates to behave more aggressively when prices are high and less aggressively when prices are low. And indeed, we can generalize that kind of finding to talk about the effects for domestic political stability. When prices are high, politics domestically tend to be pretty stable. When politics are low, these governments find themselves sapped of the revenues that they could otherwise invest in, say, repressive capacity, so paying their militaries and their police forces, or engaging in patronage, um, essentially paying off the society and providing them with a, a mixture of public and private benefits that will um, obtain that society's acquiescence. Um, so it might come as no real shock to you, and this is something you probably have intimate um, kind of uh, memories and familiarity with, that in the 1990s, this was a deeply unstable, this period during the oil glut was a deeply unstable uh, time period uh, in, in Russia's history, particularly uh, due to um, civil wars and counterinsurgencies being fought against breakaway republics um, in the Caucasus region. Okay, so I've told you what petroaggression is, and so far you haven't challenged me on the idea that it might be a real thing, so we'll just go ahead and continue with the premise that this is a, a phenomenon that we're pretty confident exists in the real world. Um, the more interesting question, I think generally speaking, is, is why? Why would a country like Russia be more prone to initiate conflicts in the first place than, say, uh, an otherwise more or less identical country uh, whose economy was more um, built around, say, the export of manufacturers or um, was more internally focused and driven the way, in large part, the U.S. economy is, is driven um, by services and other the, the kinds of eco economic modes and sectoral breakdowns that you see in other advanced economies. Well, there I'm going to talk about four mechanisms. 
in particular, and I'm going to apply those to the current situation in Ukraine. The first has to do with weakened domestic constraints. One of the things about oil and natural gas in particular is that because of the nature of production, if you've ever seen an oil field or especially an offshore oil platform, um, you know that they're very conspicuous in their presence. Um, because of the nature of oil production, the rents or the income that is generated from exploiting those reserves, which is the difference between, say, what it costs to pull it out of the ground, which varies a lot depending on where you're pulling oil out of the ground, and what obtains in international markets, because of the nature of that production and how localized and concentrated it often is, it's very easy for governments to access it as a convenient way of sort of taxing the economy as opposed to having to go out and reach out through, say, an internal revenue service into the private lives and the private accounts of their citizens. All right, so this endows them with, at times, a fairly large sort of resource base that is not predicated necessarily on the consent of the governed. So if we think that the rallying cry of the American Revolution was no taxation without representation, when you have a petro economy or a petro state, oftentimes that relationship becomes no taxation, but no representation. All right, so you have weaker kind of domestic institutional constraints in the form of lower levels of democracy on the exercise of foreign policy. So that foreign policy tends to be driven much more by the parochial interests of the regime rather than being a reflection of the desires of the populace. Okay, so that would be our kind of first mechanism. The second has to do with weaker sort of market constraints. And what I mean by that is that because of the short-term demand inelasticity of energy, which is a fancy way of saying that just because there's a war going on in Russia doesn't mean that all of us radically have reduced our demand for oil and gas or the variety of services and amenities that, those, that oil and gas provide and access to good that oil and gas provide. Um, we still demand it, even though the prices increase pretty significantly. Um, for that reason, and also because oil and natural gas, natural gas to a lesser extent for reasons I'll talk about a little bit later, are undifferentiated products. Um, you don't really care, as long as it's of sufficient quality, where your oil is coming from, or at least most consumers don't. It's very difficult to kind of freeze out of markets. And we know this even from trying to sanction a largely isolated country in, in, in the case of Iran, that Iran was still able to derive significant export revenues um, from its, its, its oil exports. So what that means is that it's much more difficult for trading partners or the global community to discipline petrostates when they behave badly because they still need the product. And even if they stop buying it directly from them, them right, the bad actor in this case, even if you stop buying it from that source, because this is a globally integrated market, it still pushes the price up for that. For, and I'll come back to actually a mechanism by which the conflict itself feeds back into greater revenues for the governments in a moment. And I'll give you a real concrete example of what I mean by this weaker market constraints in just a few moments. The third has to do with greater military spending. Um, for reasons that are related to this first mechanism, i.e. the fact that the revenues from these massive oil windfall profits, um, which can be in the hundreds of billions of dollars, indeed they're in the hundreds of billions of dollars for Russia currently, even though it's facing you know, pretty comprehensive Western sanctions of a variety of forms, um, the, the ability to capture those resources allows oil-rich countries and facilitates oil-rich countries spending much more in proportional terms on their militaries. Okay, They do this for a variety of reasons. Um, one of them is related again to this first point. If you have a population that has very little say in the policy outcomes and the way the polity is governed, that tends to generate grievances. Um, and so these governments rationally, I would say, spend additional resources on sort of repressive capacity so that they can uh, essentially deter any kind of large scale challenges to their authority, be those armed or in the form of unarmed civil resistance, the civil resistance, the types of which that you're seeing um, 
in Russia now against conscription, but also you're seeing as a result of um, the, the death of uh, an Iranian woman in Iran, which is also a petro state, um, whose ability to hang on to power despite uh, large uh, opposition and popular um, uh, displeasure with the regime in question is also a function of their oil revenues. So that's one reason why they, they, they spend more on their military. Um, they also spend more on their military because they're, they, they tend to be concerned that other countries might invade them in order to gain access to their rich natural resources. Now, the historical record is not exactly rife with examples of actual wars of conquest um, into oil states for the explicit purpose of taking oil, but that doesn't mean that that can't occur, and it doesn't mean that the concern about that doesn't condition uh, the behavior of governments rich in these resources. And then another reason is simply has to do with patronage. Um, in a system where you have a leader, you can use Putin for instance, um, who is largely governing uh, against the sort of popular will of, uh, of the populace, and this has become the case much more through the kind of disastrous conduct of the, the, the Ukrainian war than, than, than it was at the outset. Spending money lavishly on the military kind of serves two purposes. First, it increases their capacity to protect you as the leader. And second, it makes clear where their bread is buttered, so to speak. It's a way of providing sort of direct payments to those whose, whose sort of service you need most fundamentally in order to project, protect your regime. Now, everything that I've said so far sounds like the kind of normal things that most governments would do to try to protect themselves from, from say, foreign invasion or protect uh, governments to protect themselves from popular uprisings. What makes it slightly different in the case of a petrostate is the way that that military capacity interacts with these other mechanisms um, and the way in which it provides, um, in addition to having a freer hand to, to, to engage in in more aggressive kind of foreign policies, you also have the military wherewithal to back it up. And then, of course, for you IR students in the audience, I saw a couple of heads snap to attention when I said that, so presumably there are a few of you here, right? If you're spending a lot on your military and modernizing it, even for purely defensive purposes, is that necessarily how it's going to be interpreted by your neighbors? No, it is not, right? This is a classic case of what Robert Jervis referred to as a security dilemma. Actions that a, a, a well-intentioned state only interested in pursuing its own security take make it appear more threatening to its neighbors, encouraging them to, again, take similar types of actions to arm themselves and to defend themselves against potential invasion or aggression, resulting in arms races and increasing the probability or the likelihood of a breakdown in relations and bargaining that leads to war. Um, that's a massive oversimplification, but hopefully for present purposes, it gets us far enough down the field. And then finally, I want to talk a little bit about the ways in which markets, quote unquote, reward this kind of bad behavior. Now, they don't actually reward it. Um, I don't think that, you know, the, um, I don't know, the, the um, the exchange in Chicago or the London Metals Exchange gave Putin an award for goosing commodity markets, right? Um, but it is the case that the instability that's occurring in a place like Russia, for instance, is having the effect of increasing prices, irrespective of the demand fundamentals in the, essentially in the global economy. And it's doing this because it's adding something that we would call a risk premium. It's essentially an increase in the price that is a function of uncertainty about future abilities to access this resource. And as Putin has clearly done using the ability to manipulate gas flows several times uh, in the conduct of the war as, as, a, as essentially a lever, and this is actually something that the Russian regime has been doing for several decades at this point, um, it, it's very clear that this can be used for strategic purposes. So that, and I'll come to some data on this here a little bit later, even though Russia's oil output has decreased, its oil income has actually stayed pretty close to what it would get under normal market conditions because of the elevated prices at which its oil is trading. And that's true even when it was essentially cut off from trading to the West in large part and became much more dependent on oil exports um, into 
India uh, and China, the so-called Ural discount, if you've heard that term out there. Okay, so these are kind of the different mechanisms that we think lead from a reliance on hydrocarbons as the basis of the export economy and government revenues and sort of more violent and aggressive foreign policy. Now let's talk a little bit about how these factors are present in the conflict uh, in Ukraine. Um, I'm going to talk about some of those specifically with, with respect to the conduct of the, the conflict in Ukraine, but some of those I'm going to make kind of a more general kind of observation. So that's nice, Colin. You've told us this nice story about how you know having access to this cheap and easy form of revenue uh, makes it easier for the government to, to sort of disregard the policy preferences of society and not allow them a voice in governing. We call that voice in governing institutional checks and democracy, right? Um, one way of seeing that in action when thinking about the trajectory of the Soviet Union would be to look at the relationship over time between oil prices, which I alluded to earlier, and the level of democracy. Um, Measuring a concept like democracy is notoriously difficult. I am using what is kind of considered to be the industry standard at this point, which is a VDAM indicator, the Liberal Democracy Index. Uh, for, for those of you who are not IR specialists or comparative specialists, just think higher value on the index means more democracy, lower value means less. Um, so Soviet Union in, say, 1950 would be down here around zero. Saudi Arabia today would be maybe 0.1. And, you know, your Finlands or your Estonias of the world would be like 0 0.85, 0 0.9. And that's the line that you see here in red. And what you'll see is a pretty, what we would call an inverse correlation here. Um, during periods in which oil prices were relatively high, uh, the Russian and previously Soviet autocratic system was relatively stable. The period of instability that led to democratization and then later to to a variety of kind of peripheral conflicts associated with the breakup of the Soviet Union, which many of you don't have living lived memories of, but I can tell you was a very interesting time to be alive and be um, a, a student of global affairs. That kind of coincided with this period of the oil glut or the commodities glut of the 1980s and 1990s. And in the Q&A, perhaps, we can talk about kind of the mechanisms by which this, this, this operated uh, and by which the, the Soviet Union kind of progressively lost its control over and ability to kind of police its various uh, Soviet socialist republics in the USSR. Um, but for the time being, it's, it's important to note that that period of democratization coincided with low oil prices. Now, does anybody in the room know when Putin first became prime minister and then later president? Yes. Okay, right. So his, his, his ascent as a, as a national leadership level political authority, we were talking a little bit about his, his start in, in, in more local politics earlier, um, begins in 1990, uh, 1999, 2000, which is about the same time you begin the 21st century commodity boom, which is a general increase in prices for a variety of commodities, oil being one of them, but also a, a variety of industrial metals, iron, um, copper, aluminum, what have you, uh, as a result of, in large part, uh, China's sort of meteoric economic rise as an industrial power and its voracious appetite for fuel and metals. And it was during that period of higher oil incomes that, that Putin was able to do kind of two things. One of them was to reconsolidate central government control, either through direct ownership or through proxy ownership, of its large and previously um, privatized oil companies, and second was able to use the patronage system that that could fund to essentially wrangle this group that we refer to kind of collectively as the oligarchs into a, a, a more or less stable basis for political support. Now that is probably in the process of crumbling if it hasn't completely crumbled already. Um, but but this, this is a story of an oil price drop leading to domestic instability, leading to democratization, and then a slow process of re-autocratization. So a diminution, democrat, what we might call democratic backsliding occurring as oil revenues make it more and more tenable for the Russian government to rule in ways that do not involve uh, the input um, 
from the populace, either through participatory means or even through the ballot box, um, through the, the, the increasing reliance on sort of, to put it um, diplomatically, complicated elections. Okay. Now let's talk about weaker market constraints, okay? This part is probably pretty well known uh, at this point because if, if you weren't already d aware of just how dependent, uh, particularly Central Europe, was and is on Russian natural gas exports, you probably know it now. So this map I don't think is probably surprising anyone, but it shows the depth of dependence of a variety of countries uh, in, in, in Europe on Russian gas exports. Um, and for Germany, that dependence is somewhere between 30 and 40% of its, of its energy production. Uh, for Hungary, it's even greater, which may help to explain some of Hungary's reticence to take any kind of, of stand against the, the Ukrainian invasion. Um, and, and this has clearly affected the way in which Europe has been able to respond to Russian aggression in Ukraine. I would argue that you would likely see, have seen a much more forcible response, not necessarily a fully militarized response, but a much more forcible response and comprehensive response were it not the case that leaders across European capitals were in the difficult position of attempting to punish the Russian regime and deter future acts of aggression at the same time that they were deeply dependent on its natural gas exports. And because of the nature of natural gas, it's much more difficult to source from international spot markets. Spot markets just meaning markets where you kind of pay cash on the barrel head for a shipment of oil or natural gas. It's much more difficult to diversify these supplies in the short term. Now, this might seem kind of silly, but I'd like you to imagine how this war might have gone um, its trajectory, and in particular the responses of Europe, if instead of Russia being a titan of exports of natural gas, in fact its main exports to Europe were automobiles. This is a Lada SUV. Um, this Lada looks a lot nicer than the Ladas I remember pictures of from when I was a child, um, which were definitely much more boxy looking. It looks fine, right? Um, so let's say that you have the same type of invasion. What do you think happens to Lada dealerships all over Europe? Probably going into the tank. Why? Why can they do that? Because they have the ability to shop around. You're not locked into buying a Lada. You can buy a Volkswagen. You can buy a Fiat. You can buy a Peugeot. Right? You have other alternatives in the market that you can use to substitute for your previous dependence or your previous purchases of another good from another provider. So if you imagine a scenario in which Europe isn't essentially hardwired, I mean, I should say essentially, they're almost literally hardwired into dependence on Russian natural gas and in instead are dependent on it or have trade relationships with it that revolve around a, a, a you know, a good for which there are obvious and just as good market substitutes out there, it would be very difficult for Russia to have put itself in this position to begin with because it wouldn't have had the strategic leverage that came with Europe's kind of short-term deep dependence on Russian gas exports. And then the military spending component of this, I'm just going to briefly go through this and then, you know, kind of detour into a sh brief discussion of kind of the guns and bombs aspect of the war for a moment. This chart just shows the cumulative spending between Russia and Ukraine for the last 11 years or so on their militaries. And what you'll see is that for essentially every dollar invested by the Ukrainian government, it was outspent by Russia, uh, I guess on the order of, I'm bad at doing math off the top of my head, what are we talking, maybe 20, 25 to 1? Okay, um, And so going into the conflict, you have a massive asymmetry of military expenditures, which in most circumstances would translate to a massive asymmetry in military capabilities. Now, I want to be very clear about the next thing that I'm going to say, which is that I have nothing but the deepest respect and admiration for the resolve and the resiliency and indeed the bravery of the Ukrainian people in repelling an invasion from a much 
larger and ostensibly, at least at the outset of the war, notionally better equipped military. Um, but it is not doing all of that and making the gains that it's now making in the eastern regions of the country, retaking areas that had been under essentially Russian proxy control since 2014. It probably would not have been able to do that solely based on its own resources. And in fact, it's a, it's a program of Western military assistance and the sort of modern weapon systems it's given them access to for you guns and bombs heads out there in the IR community. You've got your HEMARS, right? You've got your Exc Excalibur precision munitions. Um, you've got your Javelin anti-tank weapons. All of these essentially uh, given or, or loaned, uh, in very concessionary terms, uh, to Ukraine to make up for the shortfall in military spending that it, it, it never could have been in a competitive arms with, race with Russia to begin with, but especially a Russia that is, that is benefiting from engorged kind of public coffers as a function of the high oil prices and the high prices it's able to command for its exports. Okay? All right, and then finally, this issue of markets rewarding bad behavior. These are just a couple of headlines um, that, that sort of, I think, substantiate this point. We have one coming from Al Jazeera. Russia sees 38% rise in energy export earnings this year. Um, and the actual sort of dollar amount that we're talking about here is $337 billion in revenue. Uh, you know, even 20 years from now, 30 years from now, that will still be a whole lot of money, right? Um, and then this headline from Reuters, you know, Russian oil and fuel revenue um, up even as exports fall, according to a report from the International Energy Agency. And I mentioned this earlier. Because of the instability that the war itself is creating, Russia can export less in terms of volume and still get similar revenues because of the higher prices. Okay. So hopefully all of this has, has been useful in kind of clarifying some of the mechanisms through which petroaggression can operate. And also, I think, you know, both implicitly and explicitly tie it into what we know about how price affects condition, sort of petroaggression. When prices are low, petrostates tend to be cowed. When prices are high, they tend to be emboldened. Now, in the Q&A, it would be interesting to talk about some of the other potential ancillary mechanisms that, that, that might be operating here. I, I'll leave that for, for future discussion. We might want to jump out of the realm of kind of nuts and bolts, kind of political institutional analysis, and move into the, the arena of, of psychology for a moment. But I'll table that for a second. What I want to say is how this relates to the future of Russia. And I am not a Russian expert. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that based on previous history, um, but, but talk more about what it suggests about the future of energy geopolitics. So about a century ago, uh, then um, I think it was Lord, of the Advice, Lord or Vice Lord of the Admiralty uh, in the British Navy, Winston Churchill, made the decision to convert the British Navy from using coal, um, which had a variety of... I guess I would say less than ideal properties for, for fueling a, a, a navy, to oil. Oil burned cleaner. It would, you could use less of it to get further faster. It also didn't uh, create as many emissions, which if you're trying not to get hit by other, you know, other battleships, say main guns, it's nice to not have as visible a smoke, you know, a smoke trail following behind you. All of this is good. But when when the UK decided to do this, it traded its ability to basically source most of its energy needs to supply its navy from domestic sources for dependence on resources that were outside of its territorial control. And this has been the case for all of the sort of major powers of the 20th century, with the exceptions of the United States and the Soviet Union and now Russia. All of the other major sort of economies and major military powers of the 20th century were dependent on access to resources that were outside of their direct territorial control. And for this reason, the ability to project military force and indeed increasingly over the 20th century, the ability to provide the fuel that was necessary to sustain their domestic economies was dependent on their ability to source those energy inputs from global markets or source them through force. 
And it's for that reason that I think you can call the period from 1920 to 2020 the great oil century. Oil exerted an outsized impact on global politics and international affairs in a way that no other commodity has come close to exerting. Um, but forgive me for being a little bit on the nose with the, with the imagery here, right? But th this, is a, this is a period in human history that is sunset. Before about 1850, uh, oil or petroleum had no real widespread role in human society. And it's possible that after 2050 or maybe even sooner, maybe 2030, 2040, depending, it will go back to having an extremely limited role, if any role at all, in global energy systems. And therefore, I think it's safe to say its role in global politics will be diminished as well. But from a geopolitical perspective, we're not really out of the woods yet. Because it turns out that the future energy systems, the energy systems that are being built right now, being catalyzed by incredible advances in the efficiency of wind and solar, and geothermal and hydro-powered uh, energy, the energy transitions that are occurring now are going to replace a dependence on sourcing materials like oil and natural gas from abroad to sourcing what the US government has taken to calling critical minerals many of which come from abroad. And these are the minerals that are going to be key to building these new energy systems and building the energy storage systems that go into everything from our future power grids to electric vehicles that you can buy now. I'm talking about things like bauxite, which is the raw material that goes into uh, aluminum, about 55% of which that travels around global markets are all sourced from a small West African country called Guinea with about 14 million inhabitants. I'm talking about things like copper. Uh, I'm talking about things like lithium and cobalt, about two-thirds of which is produced in the eastern uh, regions of the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is by most measures considered to be the third poorest and among maybe the 10 to 12 least politically stable countries on Earth. So that we may be exiting a period of great power politics that are revol we may be let me back up for one second. We may, be, we may actually be entering a new period of great power politics, but we may be at the same time exiting a period in which that politics was largely conditioned by concerns related to access to critical hydrocarbon energy sources. Um, in the future, those sa that same type of geopolitical wrangling may revolve much more around these types of critical minerals. And that's going to have kind of cross-cutting, I think, effects for, and forgive my parochialism here, for U.S. national security interests. On the one hand, it is going to, over the long term, deprive regimes like the one in Russia of the kinds of, of, of significant resources with which to prosecute kind of aggressive foreign policies. And I think most observers in the U.S. foreign policy community would say that that would be a good thing. Um, it's not an unalloyed blessing, I would say, because it also could usher in a period of profound political instability in Russia, um, which is still the country on Earth that has the largest nuclear arsenal. Um, and that it's not necessarily clear that any regime instability that's a function of either, say, the disastrous conduct of the war in Ukraine or a more general kind of atrophying of its economic capacity due to declining oil revenues and oil exports, it's not clear what form that transition would make, what would come afterward. I think that there are lots of, uh, of folks who would like to think and would like to tell you that what this is going to do is usher in space for democratization. Um, that's a possibility, but it's only one of several possibilities. And indeed, if you buy not my work, but the work of other political scientists like Joe Wright at Penn State, um, and Barbara Geddes and, and others, they would suggest that it's equally likely that you get some other form of authoritarian government. Um, and it's hard to know how that authoritarian government would attempt to manage its foreign affairs, its relations with Europe, and more broadly speaking, its relations with the United States. And then the other thing that I think is going to, to, to happen is that this is going to require the United States in a very, I think, significant way to, th to think about how it is that it can develop its own sustainable energy systems 
while sourcing materials from abroad to increasingly think in a serious way about using its economic policy levers and industrial policy to make sure that some of the capacity to process and refine those minerals and, and turn them into the outputs that can be used for, cr for the creation of future energy systems, electric batteries, et cetera, some of that capacity to be sourced, I think, domestically. I mean, this is, this is actually part of, of the impetus for the Inflation Reduction Act and the provisions it contained. Um, th the idea that you would want to reshore more capacity to develop these kinds of resources. Um, I think I, I'll go ahead and stop here for now. Um, hopefully, uh, this has taught you a little bit about what uh, the impact that, that, that global markets, in particular global energy markets, can have on the foreign policy behavior of oil and gas exporting states, and maybe given us a little bit of a window into th thinking about how the future of geopolitics may uh, play out uh, under the transition to more sustainable energy systems. Thank you. No, I think you need to stay here so you can answer questions under the microphone. But thank you so much. I know I learned a lot. I'm excited to hear what you all have to say. So we now move to the question and answer portion of the program. Um, for those of you in the room, there's a microphone. Um, so raise your hand and we will run it to you. Um, and then is anybody online? Nope. So never mind. Don't text me. <laughs> Aside from Russia, are there any other nations that you think the United States should be wary of when it comes to petroaggression? Oh, sure. Um, so, uh, you know, the, uh, I mean, Iran would probably be the example uh, that most in the U.S. foreign policy community would actually have identified as being the more kind of more obvious threat if you wind the clock back, say, I don't know, five years. Um, and, 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 that's in part because of the demonstrated willingness uh, in, in Iran to sort of use actual military aggression as a means of curtailing access to, to, um, to, to oil resources for the global markets. Uh, this actually was occurring uh, in a big way in the 1980s. It's, it's odd that you didn't sort of see a large effect of that in the prices that you had in the 1980s because uh, that was a time period during which Iran and Iraq, for that matter, were involved in a very large military conflict claimed about a million and a half lives. Um, but that conflict also included what were referred to as the tanker wars, which were essentially attempts by both regimes to deprive the other regime of access to revenue from the, the sale of, of oil in international markets by destroying, um, by, by attacking tankers and sinking them uh, before they would have the ability to bring product to market. Um, you know, the research on this more broadly kind of breaks these types of regimes down to sort of two categories. Um, because while these effects are, are present, they, they, they may be more kind of enticing or they may be more likely to provoke or to, be, to, to manifest themselves aggressively in certain types of regimes than others. And here I'm, I'm, I'm totally buying kind of Jeff Colgan's sort of argument about this at Brown. And his argument is that you basically have leaders who tend to be either, you could categorize as say being revisionist or status quo oriented. So the leadership of a country like Kuwait, for instance, is relatively status quo oriented. It's a small, you know, entirely kind of petro-dependent economy, which doesn't really have um, sort of the military capabilities of its own to kind of defend itself and, and maintain a, an aggressive position in international affairs. It benefits a lot from the status quo, which involves the U.S. expending significant resources to patrol um, the shipping lanes via which it's able to get its oil to, to global markets. All right, so that would be what we would think of as kind of a status quo power. Um, for most of the last 20, 30 years, people would have said the same thing about Saudi Arabia, less clear uh, based on its involvement in the conflict in Yemen. But then you have regimes like uh, the regime in Iran. Um, another example of that would be sort of before descending into, into chaos, um, the direction in which the regime in Venezuela had been heading. Less aggressively, I want, I want to be clear, a lot of, of what was going on in Venezuela had less to do with its international environment. I mean, there was an uptick in, in sort of support for the FARC rebels um, in, in Colombia under, uh, under Hugo Chavez's presidency as oil prices were rising. Um, but that, the effects there were primarily, I think, felt on the domestic economy. 
Um, and, it, you know, in, in no small part, kind of the temporary recession in oil prices that you saw in the early part of the, the, the 2010s was it was one of the contributing factors that led to kind of the 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 economic catastrophe that we now see continuing to play out in Venezuela. Hi, uh, Hi. thank you for your talk. Sure. Um, I'm curious about uh, how we can see uh, petro states interact with each other mm -hmm. and whether they uh, back each other on an international stage, and if that's because they're petro states or because they have similar regime types, and kind of how we see that interaction play out. Well, th that's a really, really interesting question. Um, so, so to the extent that they back each other, um, I, I guess there are kind of a couple ways of answering that. One would be to kind of focus on sort of the purely economic aspects of their engagement with the global economy. And the second would be to think about kind of their, their, their broader sort of suite of foreign policy interests. Um, you know, the, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, or OPEC, um, opinions vary on, on just how consequential OPEC is, but it is the case that, that since OPEC formed and since the, the, the first oil shocks, which were not necessarily undertaken by OPEC, but most of the countries that were involved in, say, the 1973 oil embargo were, were OPEC members. Most of the most consequential ones were OPEC members. Um, since then, sort of the revenues that these these governments have generated from the export of oil ha have have increased by a factor of anywhere from five to ten, um, and that's in part because they've they've realized that the ability to kind of make in concert decisions about production levels has given them pricing power in the market. Now that that relates both to real availability of product in global markets, but it also relates to the psychological component of how markets operate and how they respond to announcements um, by, say, OPEC of coordinated cuts in production or at times uh, increases in production. This actually relates to this issue of kind of status quo powers because not all of these governments are, are, are purely interested in increasing oil prices indefinitely. Um, or it's, it's a little bit more complicated calculus than that because these oil price increases, because of how critical it is as an input for modern energy systems, these oil price spikes have almost always been followed by recessions in major economies. And that's ultimately bad for, for business, seeing as their bread and butter is exporting energy to these major economies. Um, so in that case, you have status quo powers that have actually intervened in times of market instability in order to attempt to restabilize them. Most of the people in this room are too young to have remembered the first Gulf War, but that's indeed what Saudi Arabia um, and, and, and other uh, members of the Gulf Cooperation Council did in response to Operation Desert Storm at the time. They, they, they announced increases in production levels in order to tamp down price uh, pressure, upward price pressure that was a result of two major oil exporters, Iraq and Kuwait, um, being at, at temporary war with one another and then one having been subjugated by the other. In terms of their foreign policy affinities, um, you know, I think that without getting into sort of case particulars, I would say that one of the, the, the interesting things is it it is a little bit easier to infer some homogeneity of preferences, i.e., what they want to achieve from sort of consolidated liberal democracies. Autocracies tend to have fairly diverse kind of foreign policy preferences. Um, and to the extent that they have a, a especially the oil rich ones, to the extent that they have common interests in international affairs, they tend to stem from their common economic interests. Um, but more broadly, right, you have petro states that have come into conflict with one another. I, I mentioned the Iran Iraq war from the 1980s, but you can look at sort of, um, you know, sort of effectively the, the cold regional war, at times hot proxy war going on between Iran and Saudi Arabia uh, in Yemen, for instance. Yeah, uh, thank you for your talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, thinking about the future, you were talking about critical minerals. Yes. Um, and I was wondering whether the governments that have control over those mines will act or can act in the same way mm -hmm. as more like petro oriented states, especially because we know that some of these states are much weaker in their governance. And if they're going to be able to have the capacity as we become more reliant on these minerals to act as aggressively. So I, this is a great question. So my 
my my short answer to that is that I don't think it will look exactly the same. And I think that that's in part because the the way in which most critical minerals are produced simply does not kind of facilitate the massive, massive generation of, of income um, that uh, hydrocarbons do. So let me let me let me be kind of more clear about exactly what I mean by that. So if you look at if you look at say at 2020, if you look at the at the top natural gas exporter in terms of income per capita, so so actual income generated from exports on a per capita basis, that would be the United Arab Emirates at the time, which was generating I believe about fifteen thousand dollars in income per person. Um, if you look at, say, the, the, the top producer of nickel at the time, which was Indonesia, that value is about $4 per person. Um, and that's in part because, uh, be, because mining is actually much more effort and energy intensive than a lot of, of, of essentially oil production. Offshore oil production requires massive capital investments. I don't mean to diminish that. I mean, these are, these are fantastically expensive platforms to, to create. But once they're up and operating, assuming you don't have hurricanes occurring and you have regular maintenance that's being done, I mean, it's literally, not literally, it's, it's metaphorically a license to print money. And the kinds of, and, and, but the, the margins, the profit margins essentially in, in, in these other kind of mine commodity, um, in these other kind of classes of minerals are simply much smaller. So I think it's less likely that you will see the kinds of domestic effects, particularly on the institutional side. I don't think that you'll see sort of a resource curse or a, a cobalt curse that's going to re result in less democracy. What I think you will see, however, is to the extent that you have resources like cobalt that are mined in a, very, in a part of Eastern Congo that's very far from the center of power and government, Right, you will you will see additional impetus for separatism and or the creation of weak governance environments in which these things can be mined kind of quasi illegally. Um, I think that so that it may be domestically destabilizing, and then I think apart from either of those considerations, the international dimension is the one I'm worried about the most. The United States and the Soviet Union scrambled for critical minerals during the 20th century as well. Um, if you think about the ouster of um, say. Or if you think about the, 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 the rise of Pinochet, the ouster of Salvador Allende in Chile, copper rich, um, Patrice Lumumba, the first democratically elected president, and then Zaire, now the Democratic Republic of Congo, also copper rich. These were related to concerns about access to these critical minerals that were at the time also critical minerals for building energy infrastructure and for, the pro for projecting military power. Um, I'm hoping we're not headed back in that direction. Uh, the the good news so far is that by and large competition for these resources and and access to critical minerals has taken place largely through I would say market kind of interactions and transactions. So that um, that one of the largest untapped reserves of cobalt in the Eastern Congo is now owned by a Chinese company, but that was simply because a U.S. company, which had owned the rights to it for about 10 years, just decided to sell it because it didn't think it would be profitable under the current conditions uh, for them to exploit it, right? Um, so to the extent that those kind of interactions can take place in the market, that's probably better for the, for the host communities and the host countries. To the extent that they start looking a little bit more like the kinds of political competition that obtained in the 1950s and 1960s throughout the developing and middle-income world, that augurs poorly for their autonomy and domestic political stability. This is a lively row we've got over here. Colin, I really liked your map of gas dependency in Europe and okay. the, the shading of that. Uh, I had a question, uh, how dependent is Ukraine on Russia for gas and oil? Do pipelines still transit Ukraine to Europe? And of the uh, suspects of blowing up the uh, Nord Stream 1 and 2, I mean, Poland thanked America. I don't know if Ted Cruz was anywhere in the region. But Poland thanked America, Ukraine blamed Russia, and Russia blamed Ukraine. I don't know if Greenpeace has been blamed yet, but so uh, could you talk a little bit about Ukraine's dependence on Russia? Is it still a transit site for uh, gas to Europe and the implications of the defunct Nord Stream 
bombings here this week? You know, to my knowledge, uh, Greenpeace does not have access to depth charges that would be able to 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 um, penetrate uh, the oil pipelines at the depth of 80 to 120 meters. So I think we might be able to cross them off the list of usual suspects. Um, and I'm not going to speculate uh, about uh, the the provenance of those attacks, because although I will say that, a, that you know, a bright uh, IR PhD student could probably spin out a pretty good strategic story for why it would be in the incentive of several of the powers that you mentioned, and indeed others, um, to, to, to cut the pipelines or at least make it much more difficult to rely on them, uh, thus facilitating a credible commitment to a certain type of action. I won't go any further than saying that. Uh, Ukraine is is still technically, I think, a transit route. I think that that Ukraine dependence. This is this is interesting, and this is a this is a subject I'm not sure I'm entirely convinced of. But I think that there are other observers who have argued that part of the impetus for not just the the annexation of Crimea, but in, indeed the Russian sort of prosecution of a proxy war in eastern Ukraine, had to do with the discovery of significant uh, offshore gas deposits. Um, in 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 areas of the of the, the 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 sea near those regions, and then also significant onshore domestic energy resources as well. And the logic of that argument goes that this would have facilitated Ukraine, as opposed to sort of being a transit station and therefore being highly dependent on the whims of of, of Moscow uh, for its economic viability or large part of its economic viability and ties to the West. It would be able to begin developing that that infrastructure on its own and beginning begin to diversify the sources of supply for other countries in Central and Western Europe, which would have the you know, logical effect of reducing sort of the strategic leverage that Russia might have. Um, I don't have a precise number for you, but my, that's my sense of kind of how that, how that, is, how that might have contributed to the initiation of the, the territorial occupation in eastern Ukraine. Um, and, you know, potentially that, that, that tells us something about what, you know, a a potential, and I don't want to, please don't flame me online for using the term negotiated settlement when talking about the war in Ukraine, but if that is indeed one of the ways in which this ends, I think that 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 that, that is probably going to be one of the major axes or bones of contention around which uh, those negotiations will take place, and also provides Ukraine with all the impetus in the world as if they didn't already have it to want to reestablish control over their their entire sovereign territory. So, um, uh, first off, thank you for your talk. This is super interesting. And I think what you were just talking about segues really well into what I would like to ask. So my question is, what role do you think the Arctic and vast reserves of uh, oil and natural gas resources that may be potentially hidden underneath melting ice caps will uh, play in the future of petrogression and particularly aggression by Russia? Okay, great question. Um, so so there, there are lots of hydrocarbon potential uh, underneath the receding uh, Arctic ice cap, right? Um, there's also um, potential for nav navigable waterways, which would radi radically reduce shipping costs. I think if you ask people in the U.S. Coast Guard and Navy, they will tell you it'll be quite a while before merchant ships are going to be very comfortable uh, traversing <laughs> an area very, um, e even if it is sort of navigable, that it's going to be very populated by icebergs and other types of um, sort of hazards, so I don't know that that's going to be a big factor. But there's also, it's theorized that there are large deposits of critical minerals um, underneath the, the ice caps as well. I think that you've already seen a a, a, a pivot in terms of, of Russia, in particular Norway to a certain extent, um, Denmark less so, Canada kind of a medium range, and the United States not as much because the United States' attention has been elsewhere a pivot towards trying to develop the military capacity necessary to have domain awareness, know what's going on uh, in the polar region, but then also the ability to um, to to either engage in, in, in search and rescue kind of operations, but also potentially to project military force. Now, whether or not that's primarily revolving around concerns about hydrocarbons, I can't say. Um, it you know it it may be the case that that if if that is the case, then it might be a lot of investment and time and effort and massive fleets of icebreakers, in order to get there just at the time that the prize that you were in search of, it has become a wasting asset. Um, 
That wouldn't necessarily be the case with critical minerals, though. Um, but you know, the Arctic is is a really it is a very interesting case because it is it's not technically, I guess, an ungoverned space, but it, it the, the governance regime there is is I would say tenuous. Um, and so, what you may be seeing in the next ten to twenty years will be attempts, um, potentially mili mil you know. Mili militarized, potentially more diplomatic, to try and firm up what we might call the territorial kind of property rights of the Arctic states. And you're also seeing, um, for kind of similar reasons, uh, China, which has not traditionally been an Arctic state, expressing interest in and indeed attempting to influence uh, the actions of the, the relevant in governing institutions and gain access and a foot in the door, so to speak, to have a, have a say in how the, the Arctic is ultimately governed. Um, under a future scenario in which the Arctic is a much more habitable and potentially, you know, desirable kind of destination and transit route and the like. Well, I think we're going to have to wrap it up. Um, we want to thank Dr. Colin Hendricks so much for his great presentation. I, I know I learned a lot. Thank you. And I, of course, love this topic. And I also want to thank Dr. Meninga for also helping us tonight. And on behalf of Iowa City Foreign Relations Council, it's just a small gift. It's a, oh, one of their you. mugs that you can take back. This is Iowa City Foreign Relations Council on it. You can thank look you. At it here. Yeah. Um, great. I want to thank you all for coming. I apologize for our online audience. They're going to get to watch this later. And our next program next week is about Zimbabwe. We have an international writing fellow from Zimbabwe um, who's going to be talking about the situation there and how difficult it's been for people to be um, overcoming the economic and political turmoil, but it, Zaza Muchemwa is speaking next Thursday at noon at the Midwest One Bank, so look forward to that. And thank you again so much for coming tonight. Thank you.